Ghosts of Paracall. My name's Simon. And I'm McKelly. Thank you for joining us for episode 177 of our chapter by chapter book review of Song of Ice and Fire by George Martin. Today we'll be discussing chapter 33 of A Storm of Swords, that's Sam 2. And as you probably know by now, we're going to chat about the chapter and try not to spoil any future plot points for you, and hopefully we're going to provide you some entertainment along the way. We'll summarise what happened, discuss our thoughts on it, provide some useful background, compare it to the television show, indulge in a little pedantry, and cover some relevant news and listener correspondence. Be sure to check out the show notes, they'll provide some additional information about the characters and geography of this chapter. How are you, McKelly? I'm doing just fine this evening. How about yourself? I have nothing to complain about. What? Oh, that's because you got it all out during our um, wildfire side <laughs> chat. <laughs> It was an airing of grievances. Yes. The question set up for it, and you took advantage of it. <laughs> Vanessa, our sustainer, set the uh, set the ball up, and you uh, knocked it in. <laughs> the The question was, um, what is something that you don't get that everyone else seems to love? And Simon had a bulleted list about a, a page long. <laughs> he, he was pairing it on the fly as we talked. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell the regular listeners one that I have from that list. was was Now, I will say, I'd, I'd never thought to put this, but Carson suggested it to me, so I wrote it down. She said, uh, boba tea. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, the thing is, the thing about that is, I have no objection to it at all. So I, 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 that's why I, I self-edited it out during the call because uh, it's fine i don't i don't object at all but if i'm having a smoothie i don't actually need the gelatin is that what uh, okay that's what i was gonna ask that's what that is yes a friend uh molly and i went to pick up her friend one time and her friend was like oh look i got you a boba tea molly took one sip was like well not my thing and gave it to me and i enjoyed the smoothie part but the little gelatinous balls kept getting stuck in the straw and right, yeah, and yeah. then and then when I got one in my mouth, I was like, Ugh, spit it back out, you know. Yeah. So I'm exactly yeah, with that, you on that for the exact reasons. Yeah. But 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 I I don't actually dislike it. In fact, when I have one, I I drink them as well. I, I, I eat those too. But it is something that I don't really get. Uh-huh. So. Uh, you know what? I think it was this time. No, it was uh, yeah, this time last week. You and I were discussing. Going out to see the comet together on a clear night, uh-huh. and there has not uh-huh. been one single <laughs> clear night since. <laughs> I think to tomorrow night might be clear, so maybe, maybe, yeah, yeah we'll, we'll definitely see. Um, I will say that it's funny you should mention sort of clarity because it is disconcerting how your new camera is making you seem so much more present. I mean, like you're here in the room with me. <laughs> I It's practically 3D. I, I realized, you know, uh, looking at our first few wildfire side chats that my camera was really grainy. And so I took Molly's um like, you know, mounted camera that, that we bought her for... Um, quarantine education off of her computer and have been using it for last week and this week and apparently i'm radiating <laughs> yes i'm not sure that's a benefit to us <laughs> no you you actually it does look good you look you look good it's sharp and crisp and clear i am using my phone camera i look what look like what i look i like. think yours looked clearer than mine that's why i thought i i look too uh too blurry i gonna need i need to step up my game here so speaking of sustainers though you have sustainer call in our notes oh i think just to mention that we had just a great time with the, the sustainers on our we sure did regular check-in with them yes yes we um, did always a real pleasure and we had a lot of fun yeah and it's there we you know we have a time limit and we can see when it's under a minute left in the time limit but we can't see when it's officially going to cut off and it first of all, it never feels like enough time. We're always like right in the heart of discussing things and talking about stuff and other topics to get to when it gets to that, you know, minute left mark. And then it's always like, who's going to be talking last? Usually it's me. You always try to say something nice. <laughs> Maybe you should say right now, whatever it is. You preempted, you preempted my joke. It's always you. You're always blathering on with the time cuts up. Wait, you have tried to say something nice at the very last second, and I, I don't know if it's made it through or not. 
I, I think, I mean, I, I, I didn't hear the final cut, but you heard what I said. Because I said, we love you guys, and you said it cut off there and then. So yes, I don't know that. what you said. If you said anything after that, it was lost. But we love you guys, made it on. I probably said, we love you guys. Oh, I hope that made it. <laughs> well, it did. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I had my, get this, fifth visit to the dentist of 2023 this morning. It we is are only in the first week of February. First week of February, and it's my fifth visit, yeah. Goodness. But it was... That everything else, everything I've been doing has taken so long that I finished it on Thursday of last week. And she said, oh, just to mention, Simon, your six month cleaning comes up on Tuesday. <laughs> so, so it's actually, I spent the entire gap between cleanings visiting the dentist for various things. <laughs> Could they have just cleaned while they were doing whatever they were doing? Just like, you know, they're in there enough. <laughs> but but she she gave me a clean bill of health and said so we'll see you in August. But I felt like she was tempting the fates when she said that. I was like, <laughs> <You're>, <laughs> feel like something's going to hit me in the teeth any minute. Now. You're going to bite into a hard cookie exactly. or a, a, something like that, and next thing you know, you'll be right back there. Uh, the family call. The family call is always a rich vein. It the, is. Do the family tell. call has been really, really boring the last few weeks. I mean, like, it's it's been comically boring throughout. Because, you know, I mean, you know, we, we started doing this during the lockdown when it was, you know, we really had nothing to say. It was just an opportunity to get together. But right. we've always done it in the form of what's happened to you this week. And with time and sort of like familiarity, we've become less and less good at that. Sure. Right. So my sister came up with... Oh, I broke a nail. <laughs> <laughs> and then she moved on to she was stuffing a turkey. And so then the big joke became, is the nail within the, the turkey? turkey <laughs> right. will, will it pop out when the turkey's done? <laughs> but, but she followed up by saying she was talking about buying some eggs or something like that. And she said, so she just bored us to tears with this story of losing one of her nails, which was, it was a, acrylic, you know, it was like a, a attached okay, arm. Right. So it wasn't even, it wasn't even Didn't a wound. Even, right. Yeah. <laughs> she, she went from that to talk about going to buy some eggs. And me and my brother are both rolling our eyes with like, oh my God, here we go. Yeah. And she said, she said, yeah, so I went to the serial killer who sells us eggs. And we were like, wait, wait, wait now. <laughs> Again, burying the lead. Burying the lead, no doubt. She's like, she's like, yeah, the eggs are quite cheap. No, no, the serial killer. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, oh, well, yeah, he's got quite a lot of freezers and he's got really big hands. <laughs> that makes him qualified. <laughs> <laughs> My brother and I were like, God help anyone if you're ever on a jury. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> the well, size he of... did have big hands. <laughs> I just, I gotta say, I'm impressed that you all have stuck to this pretty consistently. Yeah, I mean, we all miss occasionally, you know, but we, we've we've done it for three years now, and it's... That's it's, fantastic. And it's nice for my mom, because she's kind of lonesome without it, so... Yeah. But she yeah, she is, sure. she has not changed her, like, gets fed up of our antics and hangs up on us. Oh, really? Yeah, <laughs> when she's had enough, she doesn't even say goodbye. She, <laughs> she's, ah, <laughs> she's done. Oh, that's funny. This this week, actually, she Lucas was on the call, and she said, "Hey, Lucas, how's your love life?" And hung up. Ah. Didn't wait. <laughs> Just <laughs> drop that hand grenade. <laughs> Apparently, she wasn't anticipating much of an answer. I guess. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get down to business. How do we leave Samuel Tarley? Last we saw of Sam was his and the remnants of the Great Ranging's flight from the Fist of the First Men. They are pursued by the army of the undead, and so there's no respite. Eventually, Sam falls behind outside the circle of torches that denotes their shrinking island of safety. Small Paul loses his life to an other, but Sam gets revenge by stabbing the creature with a dragonglass dagger. The other, amazingly, melts to nothing. Sam and Gren return to the rest of the Night's Watch with the news. McKelly, why don't we give them the summary of this one? All right. Well, Sam and company have reached the relative safety of Craster's Keep. Of the 60-some black brothers that escaped the fist, 44 made it to Craster's, but that number has dwindled to 41 and destined to continue to shrink due to injury and lack of nourishment. 
As a steward, Sam is tasked with caring for men like the ranger Bannon, who Sam tries to feed a thin onion broth. However, Bannon is too weak to eat and can only mumble about being so cold. Rather than offer additional rations to help return the ailing men's strength, Craster suggests the healthier men kill their weaker brothers, starting with Bannon. This, not unsurprisingly, rankles the men of the Night's Watch. The diminutive man, nicknamed Giant, tells Craster they didn't ask for his opinion, just his shelter and food, and he's grudged them the latter. Craster's defense is that he's got his wives and daughters to feed, and winter is on its way. His shelter is more than they'd have without him. In contrast to the dying going on on the floor of the hall, Craster's daughter wife Gilly is giving birth in the loft above. Sam remembers when they last visited that Gilly begged Sam to take her with him when they left. She feared she'd have a son, and Craster would give him to the gods. After a final word of abuse to Sam from Craster, Sam takes a break from tending to Bannon and goes outside for some fresh air. Sam scans the landscape. There's little in the way of defense should the others attack. However, since they've arrived at Craster's, they've been spared from any trouble from them or their whites. Craster chalks it up to him being a godly man. Sam sees men tending to the healthy horses and skinning and butchering the dead ones. He watches an archery competition and then becomes the butt of their mocking jokes. Seems that Sam dispatching the other hasn't been accepted as fact by all of his brothers. Many have taken to calling him Slayer, and Sam's not a fan of the new nickname. However, not all of his brothers think his and Gren's story is fantasy. In fact, Lord Commander Mormont thought enough of the story to ask for all of Sam's dragonglass weapons. He then dispersed the meager few among those on watch. Unfortunately, most of the large cache of dragonglass weapons John dug up on the fist were left there in the chaos of the fight and then the flight. After a conversation with Gren, where Gren points out that Slayer is an honourable nickname because of its accuracy and far superior to Sir Piggy, got to agree with that, yep. Lord Commander Mormont returns from an outing. He terrifies Sam by asking him to speak with him alone. Mormont tells Sam he thinks the discovery of the Dragon Glass's effect on the others proves that the Night's Watch has forgotten its purpose over the thousands of years. A 700-foot wall wasn't built to keep other men out, which is all wildlings are. As they begin discussing how to find more dragon glass, Craster emerges from his hall all smiles. Seems he's had a son. Seeing as how the son is one more mouth to feed, he wants the Night's Watch gone as soon as possible. In an attempt to save the newborn boy from his inevitable fate of exposure in the cold woods, Sam blurts out that if Craster doesn't want his son, the Night's Watch will take him. That offer falls flat in the ears of both Craster and Mormont. Sam is sent back inside to help with Bannon. However, once inside, he discovers that Bannon has died. That night, they make a funeral pyre for their fallen brother. Afterwards, word spreads that the men will be moving on the next morning. This puts Craster in a good mood, and he offers to feast them with horse meat from the night's watch mounts that evening. Things go awry when the food is served. Some of the brothers feel the feast is lacking and voice their opinions. Clubfoot Carl accuses Craster of being stingy, and the men start talking of the food Craster is surely hoarding away from them. Mormont orders the men to silence, and Sam thinks he's succeeded. However, Craster kicks the vocal men out of his hall while brandishing his axe. When Craster charges Carl, Dirk slits Craster's throat. Mormont tries to regain order, but is stabbed in the gut by Olo Lophand. That's when the world went mad. Sam can't fully recall the details of the chaos, but he finds himself on the floor with a dying Mormont's head in his lap. Mormont wants Sam to run to Castle Black and report all that's happened. Mormont also wants Sam to tell his son Jorah that it's his dying wish that Jorah take the Black. Also, that Geo forgives his son. With Mormont now dead, two of Craster's wives want Sam to take Gilly and her baby and flee, just like he promised he'd do the first time they were here. Gilly offers to be Sam's wife like she was Craster's. The women tell Sam they have to go now. Craster's sons will be here soon. They can feel the white cold rising. <laughs> yeah, that sounds pretty ominous. Oh, Craster's yeah. Craster's sons and the cold white. Yes, and, and, and it's when we get to that part, I've got a big question about that because it's, it's okay. an interesting, interesting terminology they use there. Right. Um, but I will say, I mean, I know it's Sam's job to nurse the dying, but good for him because it can't be easy to nurse no. a, someone who's dying sort of like 
horribly and painfully and with moaning and groaning. It's not and a starvation task. And starvation too, on top of it. Yeah. Um, sure he does stick is. to it fairly diligently, apart from the fact he walks off and lets him die. That's <laughs> true. Stuff. Apart from that. <laughs> apart from him not being there when he actually died. <laughs> uh, otherwise, he he was... <laughs> the picture of diligence. <laughs> <laughs> and given Craster's moaning and complaining about the moaning and complaining, I wouldn't have left Craster alone with Bannon for one second. Who knows what happened while he was gone? He, yes. So Bannon, we we've heard his name tossed around a little bit. He was a scout in Thorin Smallwood's group that scouted the milk water, and they were the ones that discovered Mance's huge host coming down out of the frost fangs. And he was also mentioned in Chet's prologue when Chet and company were discussing who needed to die when they made their um, escape. Uh, and Bannon was what? Bannis was, Bannon was specifically mentioned because um, he's thought of as a great tracker. And uh, they were afraid he would track them down. So yeah. it's uh, uh, Michele, it's so good that you do that because, I mean, that was completely lost on me, but... Um, you remembered it, and now it actually gives a little bit of color to Bannon, you know? Yeah, well, uh, uh, quite honestly, it was when we first came up with the idea of doing this podcast, I wanted it to be like a reader's companion because there's so many names talked yeah, yeah. about and so many characters that that was the kind of thing that I originally had in my head is reminding people of who kind of obscure characters that haven't been mentioned in a while are. Well. So. On behalf of our listeners, I thank you. Well, I appreciate that you've noticed. Um, so, Craster, Craster is not trying to win any friends. He doesn't expect any of these people to stay with him for the winter. And so, <laughs> as well as berating them, wishing them dead, telling them to kill the weak, he also eats sausages in front of them, which has got to be the, you know, possibly the worst part of this, is the, the cherry on top of his Sunday of being unpleasant right there. Yeah, yeah, he's feeding them a, a thin onion broth, and while he's complaining about them, and they have nothing, they have nothing to eat but this broth. He's cutting up a sausage and eating it. <laughs> but I will say, th- their accusation that he's got stores of food is like the most obvious thing ever. I mean, the right. man is planning to spend the winter, which is going to last five years. North of the wall, with tens of mouths to feed, yes, he's got stores of food. Yes, right. And he isn't going to crack them all open for the visiting Night's Watch. I couldn't agree more. Yes, it's, you know, there's there's 40 some of them. Winter is coming. It's not like they can, like, Craster and his wives can go down to the local market and replenish these stores. They have what they have to last a winter, like you said, could be years. Right. So... The last six months, they're eating melted snow anyway, without the help of the Night's Watch. Right, yeah. So, you know, and Sam, he goes outside and sees his brothers butchering and uh, cleaning these horses for, uh, you know, that that were too weak. So, they don't really need to bother Craster's um, food stores. They have this supply of horse meat that, you know, might... Should give them enough sustenance for them to carry on back to the Night's Watch or back right. to Castle Black. Right, and and honestly, if you didn't have enough, uh, it didn't have enough supplies for this great ranging to go the, and come back, then you weren't very well organized, and it's on yourself, you know. I'm, yeah, I'm sure. Sort of with Craster yeah. here. I'm sure they lost some in the fist, the fight on the fist, but. Oh yes, right. I they, I think that's where things went wrong. They lost pretty much everything. Uh, Sam mentions they lost all of their medicine, uh, you know, medical supplies. Right. And uh, so certainly that's where their their food is sitting. Yeah. But, uh, well, probably the, the wildlings that made it up to the fist probably have taken it yeah. since then. But So they're protected at Craster's by something. I mean, Sam says he can't see any defenses, but the, the army of the undead that's been on their heels has left them alone while they're at Craster's. Craster puts it down to his piety but i'll say if you're if you're i've seen movies with the army of the undead and being pious doesn't normally protect you not often right that is true. so yes. i'm thinking it's something other than religion keeping him safe 
and 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 I'll liken it to sort of like Second World War things when the invaders are persecuting all of your neighbors but not you then it's hard not to think that you're collaborating with them in some way yeah yeah he he refers to himself as a godly man right. pretty often in this chapter and yeah. um uh, you know he says things like you don't need to fear the others if you're a godly man and gilly says he gilly well gilly doesn't say in front of us but sam relates to us that gilly has told him that Craster gives his sons to the gods. So it seems that Craster considers the others to be gods uh. and possibly worships them by offering his sons to them. And, you know, it, it seems only, lo- like you said, it seems like only logical reason that they appear to be safe from attack that nobody else north of the wall appears to be safe like this, is that yeah. he's made some sort of deal with them. Yeah. But but actually, then I I, I realise now that Craster wasn't lying. He was just he was choosing his words to his own sort of belief system. He right. thinks of the others as the gods, and he is he's he is right with the gods by giving up his sons to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He he says swords and fire won't help you when the white cold comes. Only gods will help you. Then best get right with the gods, and and then he says. Then he says something like, I said as much to Mance Raider when he came around. And so, do you remember in the last, I think it was, um, yeah, it was the last John chapter. We were talking about how Egret mentioned them uh, releasing all those shades by digging up the graves in the frost fangs. And we had discussed the theory that I had seen online that maybe that had stirred the others. Right, yep, I remember that. Well, this line right here makes it seem like Mance was concerned about the presence of others well before they went up into the frost fangs. So Good it's, point. Good it's point. just further evidence that it doesn't seem likely that those uh, them digging up the graves had anything to do with the others' presence. I did like that as a theory, but just because of the prologue of Game of Thrones, I thought tempor- you know, sequentially the others had risen before uh, Man's Raider got into the Frost Fangs. So I, I never yeah. gave it that much credence, but I did like it as a theory. I agree. So um, one sort of common thing we notice is that every time Craster does something awful, which is pretty much whenever he's on screen, he does something <laughs> awful, um, beats one of his daughters, uh, gives a baby to the others, which clearly is what he's doing. Uh Someone says or thinks that Craster is a friend to the Night's Watch, which you've got to be careful who your friends are, really. There's a point at which you don't want friends because they are not worth having. Right. Yeah, it it feels like they're trying to remind themselves or their brothers, convince them that, you know, this is why we put up with his treatment and his behavior. He yeah. is a friend to the Night's Watch. There's one point in this chapter where Sam is relaying that he was beating one of his younger daughters. Uh, and there were very different reactions from the Night's Watch brothers, ranging from, you know, some were so disgusted that they they left. Uh, Cl- Clubfoot Carl made a joke about how if he doesn't want her, he could give her to Carl. Uh, but nobody did anything because uh, the the last one, whoever it was, said, it's his, home, it's his place, it's his rules. Yeah. Craster's a friend to the watch. Yeah. So it feels like they're doing a little bit of rationalizing. He he is feeding them and housing them while they in their hour of need. So he is he's not not a friend to them. Just right. Whether or not he's a friend worth having. I mean, particularly if if he's appeasing the gods with his sons, but is he doing more than that? Is he actually helping the gods with his sons? Sure. Yeah. So maybe right. he's exacerbating the problem that the Night's Watch is there to solve. That is a good point. Yeah. Yeah. I hadn't thought about it that way. I will say Sam has got to get thicker skin over being mocked as being the Slayer. Um, almost everyone in the Night's Watch has a nickname of some sort. You just mentioned Giant a minute ago, you know. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right? <And> small Paul. <laughs> right. And Small Paul, yeah. Uh, at least Clubfoot this... Carl. I also mentioned Clubfoot Carl. Right. <laughs> at least this name does celebrate, however mockingly, his triumph. 
Although what what he specifically complains about is that he thinks that people don't actually believe he did it. Right. And so he's being called Slayer as not just mocking him for doing it, but for mocking him for pretending to have done it. Yeah. Yeah, you know, Gren drops a, drops some wisdom on Sam during this yeah, conversation that was a little bit unexpected. He, he did say, you know, he, he did differentiate Small Paul and the Giants nicknames because those are ironic nicknames because yeah. they're the opposite. Whereas Sam did slay the other. Uh, you know, and ironic nicknames, whether they're offensive or not, all depend on the context and intention behind them. Like he mentions Thorn calling, Sam mentions Thorn calling Gren Orox, and you know that that Gren didn't like that, and he was like, "Yeah, that's because it was meant mean spirited. He meant that right. I was slow and dumb. But when my friends call me that, I it's a term of endearment because I am big and I am strong. Right, right. you know, and and I was thinking Gendry being called the bull, although he technically gave that one to himself. <laughs> you know, it, it's it's not meant to be mean. It's just that he's big, strong, stubborn, and once he had a uh, a bull helmet. But it's like George Costanza calling himself T Bone. <laughs> 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 Didn't catch on. <laughs> oh, but you know, then he dropped some other knowledge on him that I thought, who knew that Gren and Ned Stark shared such similar philosophies because uh you know when gren is trying to say you know you did kill the slayer you i mean you did kill the other you are the other slayer you should be proud of this he uh sam's argument is that he was scared and gren said no more than me sometimes i think everyone is pretending to be brave when none of us really are and it reminded me way back in chapter one of A Game of Thrones when Bran said to Ned, can a man still be brave if he's afraid? And Ned said, can only be brave. Yes. Uh, but honestly, I can't really blame the brothers for not buying Sam killing the other with a glass dagger. But by the same token, I can't really buy Sam coming back to the Brothers of the Night's Watch and pretending to have killed another. Well, yes, right, <laughs> that's right. equally unlikely. Uh, you know, uh, it do- it makes uh, Raleigh of Sisterton's suggestion a possible reality. He suggested that Sam heard rustling, uh, stabbed stabbed a bush because he heard it rustling, and it turned out a uh, small paw was behind it, using it as a privy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that was. Uh, that, and he was like, and you guys came up with a story to cover that, you know. Mm-hmm. I guess, I guess I could see how they they might think something like that, but um, you know. And, and I thought, what happened to the dead, the undead horse? You know, with, with, could they not have found that undead horse and been like, look, see, there's an undead horse right there? <laughs> but probably moseyed away. <laughs> as a as a non member of the undead, can you ride an undead horse? Would he accept you? Well, that's what. Uh, Dolores Ed thinks they're eventually going to do <laughs> because they, the undead horses eat, eat. <laughs> they eat less <laughs> I couldn't get that out I was laughing too hard so one thing that's interesting actually is that this, 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 this is an interesting question we know now that Dragonglass will kill another but we don't know if it kills whites and that hasn't right. been tested. So this is actually a bit of a concern. And it could be very tricky to fight if you have to keep switching weapons. Because obviously right. they've only got... One in each some, hand. <laughs> exactly. They've got little dragon glass daggers, but they've got metal swords. So yeah, it, it would be tricky to have to fight that way. So they need to test that little theory as quickly as possible. Sort of reminds me of um, the... Do you know how... You know the movie Alien and Aliens, etc.? I do. Uh-huh. Sigourney Weaver. Do you understand the uh, the growth and breeding of those aliens? Not off the top of my head. Well, the thing is, it, it seems to consist of like eight different stages. I mean, there's the sort of like, there's the being buried, buried in someone. There's the sticking on someone's face. There's the eggs. Right. There's all kinds of different ways that they seem to... Uh, they and I'm never incubate. sure... <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I'm never sure if it's like, you know, they're going through stages like a butterfly... Or if they are just extremely practical and sort of like their young grow wherever they are laid down, you know, be right. it an egg or be it a person or whatever. And yes. well, 
it's very tangentially related to we need to know what Dragonglass does to whites as well as I others. see the connection. It's loose, but I see it. I follow your I follow your dots, your your breadcrumbs. They made sense to me. Yeah, it is a it is a really astute observation by Sam because yeah. you know it doesn't. Well, whites are just dead humans that have been reanimated, right. whereas others are ice beings. Yep. So it would per- make perfect sense that a, a dragon glass dagger made of obsidian from the fires of the earth, as Sam says, might kill a f- an ice being, but just yep. stab a, a dead human and... Yeah, just one more hole. Right, yes. So as we mentioned, the stash of dragon glass weapons uh, was left behind at the Fist of the First Men, most of them anyway. Mormon wants more. Sam tells him, well, the children of the forest use dragon glass, and now we know why. (laughs) (laughs) Because they were afraid of others, presumably. Uh, But Lord Commander Mormont can't see how that piece of information is very useful, because it doesn't arm his men, knowing that the children of the forest had it, because they've gone. Right, yeah. Uh, Although I did find it ironic that he discounted the children of the forest existence well, talking about the others, who they also thought have been dead for 8,000 years. Good point, good point. He's annoyed that the Night's Watch have lost sight of their original mission. Okay, but... He, he's the one that brought 300 of those men north of the Wall to prevent the wildlings from making a plan for the winter. It didn't need yes. the existence of the others to already make you think, why did we build a 700-foot wall? They're just wildlings. Right, yes. This could have been... Ha- this could have been dawned on a lot earlier when you right. think about we've got this feels like overkill here right you know <laughs> and and the thing is okay he maybe had never heard of the others he maybe had never thought of the others but a dead man rose and tried to kill him before the great ranging so he knew yes. that was going on and that was enough right. to make you afraid right so i that, don't know that is true yeah yeah it, it's about the the cache of dragon glass weapons being lost it's definitely disappointing because it was such a boon for the night's watch and the fight against the others that was then left behind on the fist during the chaos and so i went back and reread john 2 of this book which is when mance and john were atop the the fist and mance realized john had lied to him about how many uh, rangers how many night's watch were north of the wall and just interjection, please. Interjection, if I might. John had lied to him about absolutely everything. Because <laughs> he was determined to be executed as a spy before he could do any spying. <laughs> that carry on. That did yes, yes. But so I went back and reread that that part of that chapter, and there is no mention of them finding the cache of dragon glass weapons, and they don't. But they do talk about defending against whites with flint and torch. So I wondered. Do the wildlings know about the dragon glass mm. effect on others? That is a great question, McKelly. Because well, thank you. <laughs> because yeah, I mean, okay, we don't know if the others have been completely quiesced for the eight, last eight thousand years. Presuming they haven't, the wildlings probably have a lot more lore about them that's still fresh in their minds than the Night's Watch did. Right. And so, yes, they might very well already know about the power of Dragonglass against the others. Yeah, we've heard Osha talk about whites to right. Bran. So, you know, we've they've certainly been around, at least she she believes that, you know, her her people have seen and killed whites. So if there's whites about, you think there's others making those whites. So yeah. but so, so I thought of thought of reasons for and against why they might know it you know maybe they maybe they don't know about it because um you know maybe they only deal with whites on a regular basis and uh you know dragon glass we don't know whether or not it works on whites right so uh you know because otherwise you'd think they'd have scrounged for every bit of dragon glass available but then i thought about well Sam tells us that the maesters think that dragon glass is made from fires of the earth, and maybe there are no fires of the earth, volcanic activity type uh, situations north of the wall. So possibly this cache of dragon glass weapons was from the Night's Watch, from 
thousands of years ago that someone had carried out there and then buried and lost it. So, you know. Yeah. Either or. Yeah. yeah. But thought experiment, if if they do know, then then they then they also know that it doesn't work on whites. Because if they know right. it works on others, then by by knowing that they would have tried it on whites, but Mance was talking about fighting the whites with flint and fire. Right. Yes. If he knew if 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 he both knew and it worked on whites, he would have said, We'll be using dragon glass on those guys because it pops them like a balloon. <laughs> right. <laughs> One prick and boom. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's all it takes. <laughs> but then about Mormont and his moment of clarity. Um I was thinking, Maester Aemon is so smart and wise, you'd think he'd have recognized that the wildlings aren't the threat that this 700-foot wall was built to guard against, and that they'd need to constantly be prepared for others. And I just wondered if maybe he had brought it up to Mormont and was ignored. Because, you know, as a Targaryen, he might also be more familiar with dragonglass or obsidian because he's surely been to Dragonstone growing right. up a Targaryen, right. and they've certainly got a big fire of the earth there. So, yep. Yep. you know. Um, I don't know if you remember, but one of the theories I had about the weather was that there were huge volcanoes north of the wall that were, would, would cause the winter. So I that, do thou that you mention it, yes. Yeah, so that, that could actually go to why you might find dragonglass north of the wall. But, but one thing about that, well, you just said that, and and obviously, on some levels, we're kind of being sneering about uh, Mormont and to a certain extent, Maester Aemon as well for not being prepared for this. But the thing is, eight thousand years is an awfully long time. If oh, you yes, read some superstition that was eight thousand years old today, you would not give it a moment's credence, not a split second's credence. Very it, true. Very true. There isn't writing 8,000 years old. You know, that's beyond human history right there. But yes. they would be they would be so removed from our level of thinking that you just wouldn't be able to give it a- any credence at all. Just saying. You're right. Yeah, no, you're right. You're right. And, you know, as you've pointed out, technology has evolved so slowly in Westeros over... 8,000 years. Suspiciously slowly. <laughs> Suspiciously <laughs> slowly. Almost like someone's holding them back. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, Gilly has had a bit... Ba- Gilly's baby turns out to be a boy, and uh, Craster complains that he's got another mouth to feed, and Sam then blurts out that he could take the boy to the Night's Watch, trying to fulfill the sort of promise he made to Gilly the first time around. Uh, but, yeah. of course, that is not the thing to say <laughs> to Craster... Or in front of Lord Commander Mormont. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> Went over like a lead balloon right. in both of their ears. I mean, I mean, if the kid was like 10 years old, yeah, maybe we could use that, you know. But it's a baby. It's a newborn baby. <laughs> yeah, you could you could feel him desperately grasping at straws, thinking of Gilly's plea and yeah. fear that her baby would be left out in the woods. But, uh, you know... Mormont's right. What are they going to... They're already in dire straits. They've got 22 right. horses and 40-some men. What are they going to do with a brand new baby? They're hoping the dead horses come back to life so they'll have mounts to get back to the Night's Watch. You know? I guess. That's true. They should have... They weigh it up. Left. Should we eat it or should we try and ride it? You know? Right. But, you know, about the about his son, he's not getting any younger, Craster. He's still leaving his sons out in the cold. Might he not want to groom an heir? You know, that isn't stir an idea. He yeah, seems a bit not selfish. A he's had. Yeah, I guess. But he's, you know, the way Sam portrays him, he's white haired and, yeah. you know, but it maybe, might be time. May, interesting thought, though. So maybe he he dies and he leaves all his wife's daughters there. They obviously can't from that point onward have any more sons would the would the uh, others leave them alone is has has he done enough to sort of pay it forward so that they're protected huh. for the long haul yeah i don't know i hadn't thought about that i don't think he cares of course craster is in it for himself he's a horrible person 
Yes, I agree with you there. Um, so it's, speaking of Craster's sons, what happens to them when they're left out in the cold? I mean, they are newborn babies. Are they made into others or whites? If they're made into whites, they'd be awfully small, toothless little whites soldiers so <laughs> you'd keep that one wouldn't you it's so cute <laughs> yeah <laughs> look how cute so do the others raise them from babies to become others is there like a school and an education program as these others come up from newborns it's kind of a fascinating mm. thought there yeah so and then i wondered if maybe craster is safe that, that they're not attacking craster because his sons have some rooted memory of him you know, of them being their, his, Craster being the father and the wives being their mother. But, you know, they were newborn babies, so you wouldn't think they would have. But, 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 but you're right. I mean, it could be a sort of like a an ingrained memory that this is, this is home, leave it alone. Yeah, I mean, I can certainly see that. Um, you're getting to the question that I was asking. Well, I mean, let's bring it forward because you started talking about the, the, the boys. Ah. Uh, the others, the boys. I mean, is this? Did he create them? I mean, obviously, they they existed in legend eight thousand years ago, which predates Craster. But you've just asked the question: Do the boys become the others? And if they do, is this some legacy? Has this been going on for centuries? And and so it's the others don't breed; they just have this sort of production line of babies so that essentially most others now are craster's sons so yeah so you're saying like 300 years ago there was another craster there was another exactly. person they made There's a deal always with. been someone making a deal but how do you make that deal i mean you can't right. communicate with you... them yeah i yeah. mean maybe maybe you have a baby boy in your arms and they point to it and say and some cowardly guy goes eh. They point at you and do like a throat slashing. Exactly. And they you're... point at the baby with their arms out. Like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Uh, I will say, so we had a discussion offline about whether or not, who knows about this, um, this other, the, the boys being left out for the others. So I went back and reread in John 3 of Clash of Kings. And that's the one when, Sam sent Gilly to talk to John about uh, taking Gilly with them when they left. And she said that if she has a boy, Craster's going to give it to the gods. When the white cold comes, he sacrifices the boys. It's been coming more often, so he had to give the sheep, which are now gone. Next will be the dogs. So... You know, the these Night's Watch... First of all, let me just derail for a second. The Night's Watch are so sure that Craster had all this food. They were talking about the pigs that they had last time they were here. That Craster had. Well, maybe those pigs were sacrificed right. to the uh, to the gods. Because he they, wasn't producing enough wait. sons. Right, yes. So, And then she says, you know, the cold gods come at night. And there are white shadows. And John it reminds John of the two whites. So he asks about the color of the eyes. She says they're bright blue. So, uh, yeah, so John did know kind of what goes on. And um, Sam also mentions in this chapter that Gilly told him about it as well. So yeah, yeah. at least those two know what happens yeah. to all the boys. So Craster's mood improves when Mormont decides that the Night's Watch is going to leave at first light. He's obviously glad to get rid of those unwanted guests. Uh, possibly also relieved that the Night's Watch won't attract the others to him because obviously like you say if it costs him resources every time they swing by he can't right. produce babies on demand and if he's losing sheep and dogs then those stores that we were talking about are dwindling again you know yeah and, and you know now that he has this son that was born today maybe he wants them gone so that they don't see him wander off into the woods with the yeah. yes with a boy baby boy and not come back with him yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but but also it's mentioned. I, I mentioned it a few minutes ago, but it's mentioned around this part that they've only got twenty two healthyish horses, but maybe thirty some to forty brothers, depending on how many can yeah. how many survive the the night. So, I was thinking, you know, they're obviously going to be short. Dollar's Ed mentions a lot of us are going to be walking. 
if only they could find John's raiding party's herd of horses that they left behind when they climbed the wall, they would be set. Uh, yeah, that's true. But I don't, I don't think they're anywhere near that part yeah. of the wall. So, so what? Well, I mean, coming to the sort of like the climax of this chapter where Mormont loses his life. One theme that's recurred in all of these books is sort of the flimsiness and the shared illusion of authority and power. And I think right. that, uh, remember the riddle that was posed to Tyrion by Varys, you know, the rich man, the priest and the king and the cell sword who has the power. Right. And uh, the answer that Varys gives is that the power lies where we believe the power lies. Exactly. Uh that veneer is not indestructible, and in this case, it only took the hunger and annoying sense of injustice to bring the whole edifice <laughs> crashing down. You know, in an instant, it sure did. Know. Yeah, and the irony of that is that there was a carefully planned coup to get rid of Mormont that came to nothing. Yeah. Yep. Nothing yep. happened. Indeed, it was foiled by the fact that there was a moment of crisis where the leadership was needed, and right. they all took the the the. the conspirators all turned to Mormont for leadership at that point, you know, and he got a small fraction of them out of there. Um, yeah. But what's different about this is that it all happens spontaneously and instantly and they don't think about it. And so they they kill Mormont without thinking about the potential downsides for them as they still have to get back to the wall somehow. Right. Leaderless and... Yes. Excellent thought there. Excellent thought. And, and speaking of the co-conspirators from Chet's prologue, a lot of the original mutiny conspirators are active in this particular chaos. Right. Clubfoot Carl was one. And his job was to cut the horse tethers to prevent a chase when, you know, in the prologue. Dirk, who kills Craster with his trademark Dirk, which mentioned in the prologue, uh, he sharpens every night. Anyway, his job was to kill Blaine, who was the leader of the Shadow Tower men in Corrin Halfhand's absence. And then Olo Lophand, who delivers the mortal stab to Mormont, was one of the co-conspirators. And there is another in who who whose name was mentioned in this chapter, but we didn't really see him do anything particularly nefarious, was uh, Sweet Donald Hill. He's the one that claims to be a Lannister bastard. Uh, right. It's unclear what happened to him in all the chaos. The only role we saw was him knocking a woman to the floor that attacked him. Right. So, right. Uh, but yeah, it's a lot of those co-conspirators. When this spur of the moment, they're hungry, they're tired, they're angry. Mutiny happens. You know, those are the guys that spring into action yeah, here. True. I also wonder if. The whole barrier to doing this was lowered by the fact that Mormont was abrogating his own authority to Craster. You know, yes. he was he was saying right. no, no, his house, his rules, so many times that he lost his veneer of power. Uh, yeah, I and can so see that. it became sure. much easier to 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 fight him then. And yeah. and the whole thing with I mean, if, if the scene is that Gilly's screaming in childbirth, Craster's attitude, which is gallingly holier than thou. And then <laughs> the trauma they've all just suffered in their retreat from the fist of the first man, and then the perceived injustice of Craster's relative comfort and war warmth, it's a gasoline soaked tinderbox, you know, and the merest yeah. thing didn't take much of a spark to set it all going and, and it nope. it went up quickly. It was two loaves of bread. That right. that wasn't enough. Two loaves <laughs> right. of bread wasn't enough. That's what started it all. <laughs> yeah. I think, and sort of like thinking more about sort of thematic things of this book, I think the other one is is the danger of promises. So Sam promised to protect Gilly and her baby, but that promise was always going to be in potential conflict with his vow. Right. His vow is to protect the the uh, defenseless. There's part of his vow that says that, right? But The realms of men. The realms of men. She counts as that. The baby right. counts as that. But you can't have a wife either so you can't i like this lady i'm going to protect her no sam you made your vows you know yeah yeah that's true it it was always a tough sell to work out how to make it happen to begin with which is why john was so flummoxed when sam sent gilly to him to ask to right. uh, yeah. you know for help he was like what am i supposed to do with you yeah but but, you know, then things go horribly wrong when Dirk kills 
Craster, and then Allo Lophand kills uh, Mormont, and Sam kind of blanks, you know, he kind of blanks out on what happens between then and when we get back to the present, it's him holding Lord Commander Mormont's head in his lap. And it's a, it's a rather sweet moment with Gior asking Sam to tell his son Jora that he forgives him and that he wishes Jora would take the black. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, I guess he wants to build a bridge to his son um, and but he knows that the only way he can come back to the seven kingdoms is by taking the black, you know, that's right. Or by doing something for jo- uh, Joffrey Bar- uh, Baratheon, because I guess yeah, it, yeah. it was Ned Stark that's who true. didn't like him and Ned Stark is gone. So yeah, that's right. He was working. Jorah was working on a pardon through Robert Baratheon right. by spying on right. Danny. Right. So, you know, that might've had that come to fruition. He might have gotten back in the good graces that Do you way. think there's any chance? Do you think that this is a possible end game for uh, Jorah, Sir Jorah? Well, I'll say it would be really cool if the pair, if Sam and Jorah were to cross paths to pay this off. That would be really neat. I didn't necessarily mean that he got the message. I meant that that, that could be Jorah's end game anyway, even without getting that message. It's hard to imagine. You know, he's he's Danny's right hand you know lord yes danny's lord commander of her queen's guard so um you know it's hard to imagine him something would really have to change danny would have to die (laughs) or you know she you know what but like i just said we know that he was spying on danny for robert baratheon if that news somehow were to come out you know she she might let him go to the wall she very well interesting yeah i thought of that (laughs) Yeah. She also might shout Dracaris, which yeah. doesn't mean <laughs> pineapple in, Val- in High Valerian. <laughs> so, uh, but it would be it would be really neat if Sam managed to get this message to Jorah. You yeah. know, I, I thought it was I, I kind of I thought it was really sweet to think about all this time. Jor secretly hoped his son would join him on the right, wall. Right, 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 right. Because he never mentions it, but deep down he secretly had hoped that that would happen. Maybe he hoped he would succeed him as Lord Commander someday and do a better job than he did as uh, succeeding him as Lord of Bear Island. Right. Which Quite. he did yes. thought such a good job at. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then the, the chapter wraps up after Lord Commander Mormont dies and Sam decides he's not scared of anything anymore. He's just going to wait here until someone gets tired of him and kills him. And the But two of Craster's wives convince Sam he needs to go right now because the white cold is coming and those are Craster's sons and he needs to take Gilly and the baby with him. And uh, that's kind of how the chapter ends. We don't, it's not for certain whether he does do that and whether he... He's going to. He seems like the kind of guy who is going to. Uh, I had two thoughts. Oh, I had lots of thoughts, but two that I'll mention. Um... One is... Stop bragging. <laughs> <laughs> well, two that are worth talking about on a recorded podcast. <laughs> <laughs> let, let us be the judge. <laughs> yeah, that's true. One is, why only Gilly? I mean, it's because the... Craster's dead. So there's not necessarily a fear that Craster is going to... That someone's going to take the baby out into the woods. So... Everyone is equally as vulnerable if the, uh, you know, Craster's sons are going to descend upon Craster's keep. So I thought about that. And and then I also thought, I'm sure Craster's wives are tough as nails, yep. tough, hardy people. Yep. But fleeing on horseback hours after giving birth, that is next level toughness well, right there. Well, true. But then again... If there's an existential threat against your newborn, you might get tough very quickly. You might, yeah, you might find a way to do it, yes. And I will say, there's a couple of ways that you can answer that first question, the why only Gilly and her baby. Do the others come when they know a boy is born? Oh, yeah. Are they looking for that boy? Are the are the wives actually sending Gilly and the baby away because they don't want him there? 
Because the others won't come if the boy's not there. The others there. won't come. The others will be led towards Sam and Gilly and the boy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And That's also, possible. the other thing is, it, they're, like you said, they're tough as nails. They think they can probably last out the winter there. Or they can saddle themselves up with this overweight, dripping coward. <laughs> <laughs> They're taking their chances at Craster's Keep, I think. Yeah. Yep. Gilly wants to go. Let her go. Take let her go. Yeah. <laughs> that's my that's my two answers to that. Yes, I like them. Okay. Do you have some background for us? I did. I did pull together some background. So while Sam's outside, he watches an archery contest between Sweet Donald Hill and an old man named Ulmer, which Ulmer wins. He appears to be the best archer on the Great Ranging because when Lord Commander Mormont divvies up the dragon glass arrowheads, Ulmer gets the most. Anyway, Ulmer claims that he was once a member of the Kingswood Brotherhood and was taught archery by a man named Fletcher Dick, who Ulmer says is the greatest archer who ever lived, so he must be from the Dornish Marches because that's where Presumably. good archers come from. So, so, what was this Kingswood Brotherhood? Well, as the name suggests, they were an outlaw group that called the Kingswood home during the reign of King Ares II. Anyway, under the leadership of a man named Simon Toyne, the outlaws became well known for kidnapping nobles and then evading capture. Part of the reason for their success in avoiding the authorities is that they were favorites of the small folk who aided and protected the group. Eventually, King Ares got so fed up with them, he sent a force into the Kingswood to deal with the Brotherhood. Sam tells us that Ulmer has mentioned this story a thousand times, and that one of the details that he always mentions is that he put an arrow through the hand of the white bull of the Kingsguard to steal a kiss from a Dornish princess. Well, we know that Sir Gerald Hightower, who was the white bull and Lord Commander of the Royal Kingsguard, uh, was injured when the Kingswood Brotherhood raided the escort of one Princess Elia Martell, who happens to be a Dornish princess. Oh. So it's very possible that the princess that uh, Elmer stole a kiss from was none other than Elia Martell, wife to Rhaegar Targaryen. Anyway, there's more to the story, but that's where we're going to stop for now, as they'll come up again before long, and we can continue the story at that point. However, I will say that back in Aria 3 of A Storm of Swords, when they were all sitting around a fire one night talking about what Beric would do with Jaime Lannister if he captured him, Tom Sevenstring sang a song about the Kingswood Brotherhood. Uh, we didn't appear to get all of the lyrics, but we got the following. The brothers of the Kingswood, they were an outlaw band. The forest was their castle, but they roamed across the land. No man's gold was safe from them, nor any maiden's hand. Oh, the brothers of the Kingswood, that fearsome outlaw band. Ah. So there you go. Well, thank you, sir. Appreciate that. You're quite welcome. Comparison with the television show, this is mostly captured. Um, the uh, Bannon's death, uh, the funeral pyre for Bannon, the general feeling of unfairness as Craster eats and drinks. Um, slight difference is that Gilly has already had her baby and she's sort oh. of keeping the baby's ge she's trying to keep out of Craster's eye line because she doesn't want Craster to know the gender of her baby okay. so uh, that's a slight difference uh, the fight is very similar although Rast um, who I think was a, is a character who's been in the books right? I, th I think so, yeah. But he hasn't... He I hasn't know been, the name. Yeah. I I think it's from the books. Yeah, he's he's been much more prominent in the show. He He's one of the ringleaders of the of the fight in Craster's Keep. And when the fight is over and uh, Sam flees with Gilly and the baby, uh, Rath shouts after them that he's going to... Uh, he can run, but he's going to be found eventually. So um, Sam, Sam may have one more pursuer. Oh, okay. Okay, uh, but but otherwise, I mean, basically, the the whole thing was captured pretty well. All right, Pendragon. I didn't really see anything here. I mean, there's there's lots going on, but nothing was nothing nothing tickled my pedantic bone. No, me either. I did wonder how Sam and Gren managed to catch up with the 
the main body of the Knights uh, watch when they were moving because <laughs> they're not the swiftest. Yeah. I, I guess adrenaline might uh, propel you forward. Yeah. <laughs> but but uh, I did wonder how that happened. <laughs> the adrenaline would have been pumping for a long time before then, though. That's that's the thing. It doesn't last forever. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> News and notes. Uh, well, one thing uh, I wanted to mention, again, it wasn't a really... Um, a Song of Ice and Fire, or Game of Thrones, or House of the Dragon, or whatever heavy uh, news week. There hasn't been a lot come out lately. Uh, so just focus on Ghost of Harrenhal news. And, and one thing I wanted to mention is that our uh, Buy Me a Coffee sustainer, Vanessa, has begun cataloging all of our background content. And she's done, I looked at the, uh, you know, the work she's put together so far, it's an amazing effort. I was so impressed. She, she's, and it'd be She's not doing it just off the audio. You've given her the scripts. No. Oh she's my doing God. it off the give audio the, as give best her the I can scripts, tell. At least. I, I I will do that, yes. But Because uh, she could at least she could at least search that, you know. Yes, right, yeah. Uh she's what I've seen so far, I, I haven't had a great deal of time to, to fully dig into all of the uh content but it looks like really useful stuff and you know background we've mentioned on the show is becoming more of a challenge because when we bring something up i can't bring it up again yeah. and there's only a finite amount of content to work with mckelly the reason that i'm such a good friend of yours is that you can always do that for me because i won't remember the first time you said it and so it'll be <laughs> fresh and interesting to me good point good point i'll keep that in mind hopefully everybody feels the same way um and just a reminder that um the buy me a coffee sustainer levels. We've got two tiers: the uh, Knight of the Realm and the Lord Paramount. Yep. I always have to check that with McKelly because I'm always afraid I'm going to get that one wrong. Uh, and the well, Lord... we also have our Royal Kingsguard, but that the is a Royal Kingsguard tier. is the locked in one, right? Yeah. So yes. the Lord Paramount level gets you uh, invites to all of the uh, sustainer calls every year. The Knight of the Realm level. Didn't used to have that, but we've just increased the value of the Knight of the Realm level by inviting you to two of our sustainer calls each year. Once you've come to yes. one of those, you will upgrade to the Lord Paramount. That's, <laughs> that's, that's right. the trick here, because yes, you're going to want to yes. be part of that gang. Yeah, you're not going to want to just get it twice a year. You're going to want to be there every time. <laughs> we got a review. We did. It, it made me laugh. <laughs> It made me laugh because of the there's a request in it. Do, do you want to read it or do you? No, you can read it. it. You can read it. I it didn't make me laugh. I I, I, I felt a little tear roll down my cheek as I read it. <laughs> well, yes, <laughs> yes, that's another reaction you can have to the request. So uh, here's here's how it goes. It's from uh, GOT book fan uh, off of Apple Podcasts, and the subject is. More than one per week, please, which is where the tear or the laugh comes uh -huh. in. <laughs> uh, just ordered the books to read for the first time and wanted to try to stay engaged with the first book, even though I knew most of the plot points from the show. Really enjoy this as I am reading along, but I'm going through the book so much faster than the podcast. I wish they would do more than one chapter per week so I could keep listening while reading. <laughs> so thank you thank you so much for the five five star yeah rate and the in the very kind review yes it's very kind and we would love to i mean if we just didn't have day jobs i'm sure we could do i'm sure we could do two a week without day jobs right <laughs> when, when we were doing that episode bonanzas that, that's what we were oh, calling that's it right what we called it that's right we did two a week for a while God. that that was brutal and that was when the story was much simpler yeah it is yeah. getting so when, complicated when, when the background just lay thick across the floor like, <laughs> right. like leaves in the forest yes um yeah i mean we just to give you give everyone an example it's been a week and a day since we recorded last week's episode so it took more than a week just to pull this together so yeah. doing more than one a week we would love to we'd love to but um, unfortunately it's not the most feasible of things have you heard of Chat GPT? I have. You tried it. I I I I I remember where we talked about Chat GPT. It was on the Sustainers Call. It was on the Sustainers uh, Call. Yes. Maybe we could get Chat GPT to write episodes for us. <coughs> Ixnay on the. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I asked it earlier, what is the best A Song of Ice and Fire podcast? <laughs> oh, no. But it's, it's, it's down. It wouldn't answer any questions. So I, I never oh. found out. But I'm very curious to know. <laughs> yeah, I want to know too. <laughs> but I tell you what, to, to the Game of Thrones book fan uh, reviewer, which again, thank you. We really appreciate the review. I, I think we can get to this point. I think I, I see us becoming more and more as the just the... Just the voice piece of a cottage industry, McKelly. Okay. Yeah. Eventually, we're going to have a script delivered to us every evening. Yes. We're yes. going to record it, <laughs> and then the elves will take over and turn that into a well-polished episode. <laughs> Our, oh. We'll have minions like George Martin. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's that's what we need. Do you know how many times when I'm preparing a sheet, I think, oh, I wish I had an intern to do this right. part. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I mean, we could do five a week easily. At that, if it was just the recording. Every, oh, yes. That's the funnest part of this because we, we just get to chat for an hour or three. Right. <laughs> <All> right. <laughs> yes, absolutely it is. And just finally, I just wanted to uh, say... Please keep up the great work rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts, such as GOT Book Fan did here, as well as Spotify. We are still crushing it on Spotify. We are our lead over all of the other Song of Ice and Fire podcasts continues to grow, and we are the only 5.0 uh, podcast out there. So please keep up those five star rates and please keep reviewing us on Apple Podcasts and anywhere else. It's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Let's conclude. So the Great Rangings, uh, I mean, it's been a disaster for a while, but now it's a complete disaster. You know, now, yes. now the one thing that Mance Raider was hopeful of, Mormont's death, has come to pass. So now the wall is all the more vulnerable. Yes, it is an utter, oh, just just an utter, utter disaster. You remember when Tyrion was at the wall? Uh-huh. He was told that the entire Night's Watch is less than a thousand people right now. There's 600-ish at Castle Black, 200-ish at the Shadow Tower, and less than that at East Watch by the Sea. Well, this Great Ranging had 200 from Castle Black, which are now wiped out. Yeah. So, uh, and then 100 from the Shadow Tower, which are now wiped out. So 50% of the Shadow Tower men yeah. have been wiped out so yeah this it really couldn't come at a worse time either obviously because this is the time when the night's watch are supposed to do what they've been waiting around for eight thousand years to do yes that 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 moment of clarity the day before he died or the day he died was uh yes. just a little too late for mama yeah uh craster's dead we we won't eulogize craster because he, no if anyone deserved it it was craster uh right we do worry a little bit for what befalls his wives now. Yes. Yeah, yeah. They are alone. Absolutely. And presumably they don't have a ready supply of sons to offer to the gods. Right. Yeah. I mean, if it wasn't for that, I'm sure they'd do fine. I'm sure they did most of the oh, daily work. Absolutely. Anyway, it's the fact that they can't provide sons for the right. others that is the issue. Right. But then your idea is interesting that if, if the others are predominantly the sons of Craster that they may actually just avoid the place because it's home, you know? So Oh, sure. Yeah. They they might get away with it. They might actually be able to to uh live out the winter there. Would they really come and harm their mamas? Exactly. I mean, come yeah. on. But so Sam appears to have been separated from John. We know he's separated from John, but also Gren, Dolores Ed and anyone else he can rely on. So it's unclear if he'll flee like he's been begged to do so with Gilly and the baby, but, you know, we, we seem to think that he will based yeah. on what we know of Sam. Yeah. I mean, honestly, he needs the company. I would I would trust <laughs> Sam and Gilly to get to the wall more than Sam on his own, to be honest. <laughs> True. <laughs> yeah. It, it, if he has left, if he does leave, it's it's an opportunity for him to step up and be the man that we know he can be, yeah. but that he doesn't realize he's capable of being. And I think, in many ways, Gilly is the is the catalyst for that. On his own, he'll be a sniveling wreck. But with Gilly there, to that he has to protect, I think he can start to reveal his true, true colors, which are very hidden, 
<laughs> many layers deep but there is there is a brave soul in there somewhere yes there is yeah uh, where are we going next uh next week we visit we uh visit aria <gasps> are we gonna get to meet Beric and Darian? <laughs> <laughs> well i won't spoil whether we do or not but i will say that we get uh get to the bottom of who the prisoner that was the answer to her prayers oh that's a good is. point yes 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 a- and we will witness a miracle oh excellent looking forward to it so you're not gonna want to miss next week's episode okay there's three ways that you can help us you can leave us a review uh just as got book fan did you can buy merchandise at ghosts of com. you can buy us a cup of arbor gold at buymeacoffee.com slash ghost where you can become a sustainer at the Lord Paramount or Knight of the Realm level and accrue the benefits therewith. I did my bit. We're up to you, as always. And as always, you can reach us at ghosts.heronhall at gmail.com and you can go out and follow us on Twitter. We're at Ghost Heron Hall. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Discord, and YouTube. Thanks for listening. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.